We do case interviews at BridgeBand because we find they are a helpful way to talk about the work we do on a day-to-day -day basis, as well as a way to get insight into how you think about and solve problems. The video you are about to watch is going to illustrate what kinds of questions to expect in a given BridgeBand case interview, and it's going to give examples of what good answers to these questions look like. After I ask each question, we'll show responses from three candidates. The interview performance for each of these candidates is very good, likely good enough to pass them through to the next stage, which is reflected in the fact that there is no one right way to do a case interview. However, we will pause after each set of responses to delve into what makes one of the three answers stand out above the rest. Let's get started. Your client in this case is the Beacon Foundation, which is committed to enrolling and graduating more students from college. Specifically, its goal is for 60% of Americans to graduate from college. For reference, only 40% of Americans successfully do this today. Over the last 10 years, Beacon has identified effective practices that increase college access and success, and it believes that its big goal would be in reach if more youth were exposed to those practices. Some examples include increasing knowledge about admissions processes and financial aid, as well as providing access to tutoring. Beacon has decided that the best way to spread effective practices is by partnering with youth-serving national networks and incorporating its practices into the existing programs of those networks. To start, if you were on the team advising Beacon, how would you suggest they think about the network partnerships? So nonprofits should always think about impact first and what strategy is going to help them maximize the impact they have in the world. Total impact can be thought about as having two dimensions, breadth, meaning how many people you reach, and depth, which is how much you influence each person's life for the better. So if I'm Beacon, I would want to think about network partnerships along those two dimensions, depth and breadth. What partnerships will enable you to reach the most people and how meaningfully you can help people in each situation. The ideal set of partners will allow Beacon to access as many youth as possible and will also allow Beacon to integrate deeply enough into their existing programming to fully deliver the services that research has shown are effective. From my own experience volunteering in the nonprofit world and watching attempts at nonprofit collaboration, uh, I'd say that Beacon should think about several things that I've seen influence whether or not collaboration is successful. First, uh, I think about organizational health. Do potential partners have the leadership, talent, and resources to actually execute? If this isn't there, then collaboration won't work. Second, I want to understand the data collection uh, abilities of each potential partner. It's critical to know whether progress is being made, and that can't happen if data is not available. Third, what's the history of partnering with other organizations? Is this something partners do with a lot of others, or are they generally just doing work in a silo, which could be a red flag? Fourth, a mission alignment. Do the partners have the same ultimate goals? When I volunteered in an after-school tutoring program, uh, we teamed up with the City Hunger Relief Agency uh, to make sure that kids had after-school snacks provided, uh, which gave them the energy they needed to power through homework with us tutors. Uh, even though our tutoring program and the Hunger Relief Agency did different things, we both wanted to serve disadvantaged kids, and we both ultimately wanted those kids to be healthy uh, and prepared enough to succeed in school. Uh, and finally, fifth, I would advise Beacon to consider what the governance arrangement will be. How will they pull resources, and how will mutual accountability be ensured? Beacon's role is a big one, increasing the percentage of Americans with college degrees from 40% today to 60% means that we need to reach a lot of young people very quickly. Therefore, the first thing I would advise Beacon to consider as they assess possible network partners is their scale. How much would each partner expand your reach? In addition to pure numbers reach, the second thing I would consider is whether the youth being reached are the ones who are in need. Are they kids who likely wouldn't graduate from college in, in the status quo, but for whom Beacon services can make a difference? So alignment of target population would be my second criteria. 
Finally, I would advise Beacon to think about the likelihood that they can successfully embed their practices with each potential partner, based on how willing and capable each is. For example, you'll want to screen out potential partners who are in a bad financial situation and perhaps also those without a track record of good partnerships with other nonprofits. All three candidates gave strong answers and would be given high marks for these responses. The answer that stands out the most is number three from Zoe. We like this answer because Zoe zeroed in on perhaps the most important fact about this particular situation, that Beacon's goal is very ambitious and that they will need to reach a very large amount of youth to meet their target. She also named some of the other considerations, but she focused on this differentiating part of the challenge in her answer. Hansei's answer is also good. We like that he drew from his personal experience and he was able to brainstorm a number of key issues which speaks to his depth of understanding about the social sector and shows sound business judgment. He could have strengthened his answer if he had prioritized his list in a more logical way, as for example, it's not clear whether data collection abilities would be as important of an issue as, say, mission alignment. Michelle's answer was also good, and we like that she offered a clear framework for thinking about this question. However, while her framework of depth and breadth does make sense in this context, it can also be generically applied no matter who the client is. And Michelle didn't push as far as we would have ideally liked into the specific issues for this client. Preparing a couple of broadly applicable frameworks can be, good, can be a good idea, but remember to also immerse yourself in a specific situation. You've identified that scale is an important issue for Beacon to consider. Given that its goal of having 60% of Americans graduate with a college degree requires a big shift from today, let's make a quantitative estimate of how many additional Americans would need college degrees to reach the 60% target. In other words, what's the approximate market size we are dealing with? Beacon wants to know how many additional Americans it needs to help graduate from college in order to achieve its ambitious goal. I know first from some recent research I did for my honors thesis that about 2 million Americans graduate from college each year in the present day. Since Beacon wants to increase the percentage of Americans that this represents from 40% to 60%, that means that they need to increase the number of college graduates by a factor of 1.5. That means that in 2025, there need to be 3 million Americans graduating from college each year instead of 2 million Americans. So Beacon will need to reach an additional 1 million youth each year. So in our case, the market size is the number of additional Americans who would need college degrees to meet the 60% goal. Uh, to estimate this, I'll start with the total population of the U.S. Uh, narrow that down to the number that could be entering college each year, uh, and then calculate the delta between today's 40% figure and the desired 60% goal. Uh, so I believe the total population of the U.S. right now is 320 million. Uh, for simplicity, let's say they are re well, relatively evenly distributed between age 0 and age 80. Uh, and then through basic division, we can figure out that there are about um, 40 4 million uh, Americans of any given age. Uh, for example, there are 4 million Americans who are age 22 right now, a common age at which to graduate college. Uh, today, 40% of those 4 million uh, are indeed graduating from college, which equates to uh, 1.6 million per year. Uh, if that was instead 60%, um, then it would be 2.4 million per year. Uh, that's a difference of 2.4 minus 1.6, which equals uh, 800,000 additional Americans uh, graduating from college each year. So Beacon would need to support an additional 800,000 kids uh, each year to enter and graduate from college. Uh, one thing to note is that we're seeing more and more older students enter college these days, uh, such as military veterans, for example. It sounds like from your description that Beacon is focusing on youth serving national networks as partners, but it may consider whether support for older students could also contribute toward the additional 800,000 students per year goal.
The population of the U.S. is about 300 million. And we know that 40% or 120 million have degrees right now. The goal is for 60% of them to have college degrees, which would be a total of 60 million more Americans ultimately earning this credential. I assume, though, that Beacon wants to achieve its goal on some time frame. Let's say it's over the next 20 years. That means that they would need to reach an additional 60 million divided by 20, which equals 3 million Americans a year. That feels like a huge number of people to reach. In fact, if the population is 300 million Americans, and I assume they are roughly sp spread evenly over the age spectrum of 0 to 80 years old, then there are less than 4 million people of the age to enter college each year. Some of them are already going to college, so it's impossible to reach an additional 3 million of them. Could I have a second to recheck my logic? I see. I assume that 60% of all Americans need to have college degrees in the next 20 years. But that wouldn't make sense, given that some of those people will be infants and others will be in senior citizen homes. Instead, we can look at how many additional Americans need to graduate college each year. We know that 40% of 4 million people in each year of age already graduate, which is about 1.6 million. And we want this number to be 60%, or 2.4 million. That means that the true market size Beacon needs to reach is just under 1 million people per year. In the last response we showed you, Zoe did a nice job of recovering after making an error with one of her assumptions. What was strong about her answer is that she sense-checked it on her own, immediately realized it didn't make sense, quickly figured out why, and adapted. This shows good judgment, and being able to quickly catch your own errors is an important skill in our day-to-day -day work. The person who did the best job breaking down the question and working through the calculation was Hanse. Hanse did two things that we like to see. First, he walked through how he was going to do the calculation up front before he plugged in any numbers. This allows me as the interviewer to know that he was thinking about the calculation in a logical way before we got into the weeds of the math. Second, he made sure to step through every calculation that he did along the way so that I could follow. Remember, our goal in the case interview is to really understand your thought process, so to be sure to say out loud what you were doing in your head. The first respondent, Michelle, managed to simplify the math by starting from a data point that she knew, how many Americans graduate college each year, versus starting with the total U.S. population. It is fine to do this, but we don't expect candidates to memorize data points, nor do we think it's a good use of preparation time to memorize things that are easily looked up. Michelle was able to work through the math in a clear and streamlined way and arrived at the right answer. But if she had made a simple calculation error, it would have been hard for the interviewer to realize what went wrong, since she jumped straight into the math rather than setting up the approach first. Now we are going to evaluate some real potential partners for Beacon. I'll give you some information about each of the three possible partners. Possible Partner A focuses on driving awareness of the high school and college dropout crisis. They have 400 major partners in the field, and their beneficiaries are all in grades 6 through 12. Possible Partner B provides a wide range of basic social services, including some related to education. They serve 30 million Americans of all ages each year. Possible Partner C provides a wide range of daily programs to youth in its national network of clubs, each year, 4.1 million youth come to its clubs, and 40% of them are in the target age range for Beacon. While Beacon can work with more than one partner in this effort, which of these three partners would you prioritize based on the information available and why? I'll just take a second to think this through.
So going back to the framework I described at the outset, I think there are two dimensions to consider, depth and breadth. The breadth question is more straightforward. How many youth can each potential partner reach that Beacon's programming could help? The depth question centers on which partners are most able and likely to deeply embed Beacon's evidence-based programming into their work. Although we unfortunately don't have breadth numbers for a possible partner A, I think we can assume that they have pretty broad reach since they work with 400 major partners in the field. Depth would be a big question for me though. We would have to believe that they can influence these 400 partners to implement Beacon's practices with fidelity, and I'm skeptical of that. Possible partner B has huge breadth, but its beneficiaries span all ages, and while you never want to say never, we can assume that many of these people are too old or too young to be likely candidates for getting college degrees. So even if they could provide all of Beacon's services to everyone, I think the yield of additional college grads might be kind of low. Possible partner C is the most intriguing to me. They may not reach as many people as the other two, but a large percentage of those that they reach are in the target age range. And because they are already delivering education programs, it's credible to believe that they could deliver Beacon's practices at the depth necessary. I would therefore prioritize them. Let's walk through them together one at a time. I don't think we have enough information to analyze A because we only know how many partners they have and we don't uh, have an indication of how many kids they might reach. Uh, so I'm going to exclude it for now, though in real life we could come back to it if we got more information. I also don't feel we know enough about B to make an assessment because it reaches a ton of people, uh, but we don't know whether there are concentrations of people in any age cluster. If there is a concentration of young people, they would become quite attractive. C is the potential partner that I would be most enthusiastic about based on the information we have. Uh, the fact that 40% of the kids they serve are also ones Beacon wants to reach is a good sign that its mission is largely aligned with Beacon's, which we talked about before as being one of the keys to a successful nonprofit collaboration. Uh, the fact that they run a lot of different programs in their clubs indicates to me that they must be as strong and versatile uh, as, an or as an organization. And if Beacon can access all of the kids in their target range being served by potential partner C, that would be more than enough to help them reach their goal of increasing the number of college graduates each year by 800,000. I'll just take a second to think this through. From the start, we've been talking about scale being one of the most important criteria. So I would start by considering how many people can be reached through each partner, and how many of these would be in Beacon's target range. Potential partner A has 400 major partners in the field, all serving kids in Beacon's sweet spot. I'll assume each partner reaches an average of 1,000 kids. So that's 400,000 kids that could be reached. Potential partner B reaches 30 million Americans of all ages, and I'll assume that 10% are in the, that target range. So that would equate to a reach of 3 million kids, larger than potential partner A. Potential partner C reaches about 4 million youth, and since 40% of them are in the target range, that equates to an approximate relevant reach of 1.6 million youth. Based on this, potential partner B offers access to by far the most kids in the target age range. I would want to learn more about its organizational capacity and its appetite for a partnership, but for the time being, I would prioritize them. All three of these answers are very strong. Each person works their way to a logical recommendation and clearly states which of the three they would prioritize. Of the three, the first response from Michelle stands out as the strongest. She hearkened back to her original framework for the case which demonstrates that she is maintaining an organized line of thinking throughout our conversation. Originally, Michelle offered this framework a bit generically, but with this answer, she applied it nicely to Beacon's specific situation. Another tactic that she used is considering what would you have to believe in order for each partner to be the best, which is an example 
of a way of thinking that we call being hypothesis driven. This way of thinking allows you to deprioritize some lines of inquiry, in this case potential partner A, and prioritize the ones where what you would have to believe is less far-fetched. The second and third responses from Zoe and Hanse are also strong, but both wrestle with the fact that they have incomplete information about the potential partners. In situations like this, we are looking to see how comfortable candidates are with ambiguity, because very few things are cut and dry in the social sector. Hanse deals with the ambiguity by choosing the one partner where he feels he has enough information, but he does note that it's worth revisiting the others if we can learn more. That's a reasonable way to approach it, but we would have liked to see a little bit more of an attempt to analyze the other two first. Zoe deals with the ambiguity in the opposite way, by making an assumption in every spot where she doesn't have the information. This is also sometimes a good way to deal with ambiguity, but we would have liked to see Zoe explain more of her rationale behind each assumption before just applying them. Now let's fast forward a bit. Let's assume that your bridge band team has agreed with your analysis and your recommendation on who to prioritize, and that you are ready to share your recommendation with the client. As you are getting ready to talk with each of the key client leaders, you learn that several of them have developed strong opinions on a few potential partners based on anecdotal experiences. How would you influence clients with strong views that may or may not be entirely accurate? I can understand how our clients might have developed strong views if this is a question that they've been grappling for some time. But I think we can get them out of this mindset by walking through the question in an analytical way. I would, I would work to take each client through our work step by step, explaining every data point and assumption. I know that BridgePan selects clients who are deeply committed to their goals, and because of this, I think analysis will eventually trump anecdotes if we just take care to patiently explain our work. The first thing I would do is listen. My team and I may have done a lot of analysis, but the clients have spent years living and breathing their work. And if they have views on players in the field, we should listen to what they are and decide whether or not they would influence our recommendation. By really listening to them, we'll hopefully also create an opening for them to listen to us. I have to imagine that part of the reason they hired us is because they think they need an objective, outside-in perspective from people who are not immersed in the weeds every day, and our analysis can provide that. I expect that part of our analysis will resonate with their anecdotal experiences, which will strengthen our credibility even more. The decision on partnering ultimately belongs to the client, and I think it's healthy for all perspectives to be shared, as long as it's clear what each of them is based upon. I really like this question because I studied and practiced debate in college, and I think a lot about how you really influence people, because that is the key to bringing about social change, and change is so important in the social sector. I like to think about the from to, where a client's head is at the beginning versus where you want them to be at the end, and then consider what the key points are that I need to land in order to move them from point A to point B. In this case, it sounds like the clients are starting off with some strong preconceived opinions on who to partner with, but without much to base them on, beyond a couple of stories and a gut feel. I want them to eventually end up in a place where they are excited about our recommended partner and feel ready to move ahead. Again, all of these answers are very solid. Each demonstrates empathy for the clients and the fact that it's not a good idea to enforce our recommendation nor simply deliver it and walk away. Of the three answers, the middle one from Hanse stands out as the best. His answer conveys the level of humility that Bridgman seeks to bring to his clients. It acknowledges that hearing people out when they feel strongly about something could be additive to our analysis. It also feels the most actionable. By contrast, while Michelle's strategy seems like it could also work, she doesn't address how we would get the opportunity to slowly walk through the analysis with a client eager to jump to a preconceived answer. And while Zoe's framework is a good one, she doesn't get tactical about what points she would make or where she would start. Overall, three strong case interviews from our candidates. 
We hope this video has been helpful in illustrating good ways to approach our case questions.